Good morning, everybody. Welcome to First Light Talk number 13. I am Mike with Obviously Outdoorsman. If you guys are new to this podcast, I'd like to start off with a current news article. Today's current news article is Researchers Explore Ways to Make Hatchery Steelhead More Like Wild Fish. And this is by Oregon State University. And by the way, today is Wednesday, January 19th, 2022. Hope you're getting up, getting after it this morning. And uh, back to the article, all right? Hatchery-raised steelhead trout have offspring that are good at gaining size under hatchery conditions, but they don't survive as well in the streams as steelhead whose parents are wild fish. So raised by hatchery or raised, raised by their actual steelhead parents, they don't, they don't survive as well when they're raised under hatchery conditions. And this is shown by all the new research that is out there trying to change that. All right, steelhead hatcheries provide fish for harvest and to supplement wild stocks. So a lot of times these fish and hatcheries are just put out there to be caught and to be harvested by anglers. Uh, this is a big thing with like New Jersey, PA, and I know a lot of these uh, a lot of these states, they just stock fish for the anglers for that specific season, and 90% of them get caught. So it's just for the anglers aspect, not so much for uh, the population of that specific species. All right, just like salmon, steelhead are anadromous, which means they travel to the ocean as smolts and return to their birth streams to spawn. So the hatchery will raise the eggs and the juvenile fish for about a year, then release them to go to sea with hopes that they come back to the river to spawn. But in recent studies, there's been a very low return to river rate for these stocked fish. All right, hatchery fish make for a better broad stock fish on average, but they want to incorporate the return rate as well. So instead of just being a bigger fish, which is a broad stock program, they they are generally bigger fish that are stocked into these streams and rivers, but they also want to incorporate the return rate. So they will return from the sea back into the river to spawn. And if there's a low return rate, that means less fish are spawning every year. All right, the bigger fish to return rate trade-off happens because hatcheries are inadvertently favoring genes that promote growth in hatchery at a cost to survival in the wild. So this new study shows new research that may solve this problem of not only bigger fish, but actual wild traits that will help them in the wild as well. And by modifying hatchery conditions so they don't accidentally quote unquote select traits that favor growth at the expense of surviving in the wild, so in evolutionary biology, selection is basically beneficial genes being passed on to improve a species chance of survival in a certain environment. And by the way, I did go to school for biology for about three years. So I am not ignorant on this aspect and completely. So I do know a lot of little terms like this. And uh, so they pass on certain genes, the beneficial genes, to give them a better chance at survival in a certain environment. So a good example of this is like the key deer versus like Alberta deer. So deer up in Alberta, they are massive. Their bodies are just huge. They ha huge. They have a colder winter. They need that extra fat. They need extra everything to be able to survive that harsh winter. Versus the key deer or the Florida key deer way down South Florida. These deer are just a little bit bigger than like a German shepherd dog. They are not big animals at all. But it's not cold there. It's like 80 degrees year round. It's always hot and they don't need to put on as much fat for a harsher winter or anything like that. So that gene of being able to just be smaller and they don't have to eat as much and pack on as much fat then that's beneficial for them down in florida but if that deer went up to alberta canada for a year that thing would die immediately because as soon as it got cold that thing would die so back to the hatchery it's meant to create more of a species but in the hatchery it's ideal so there's no predators it's, they get a high calorie dense food and it's crowded, which is the complete opposite in the wild, where there's predators, low food, and fish are nowhere near as bunched up. It's pretty scarce to have a couple together. And if you have a couple together, that's it for a little bit. It's not like 
there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish just bunched up together, especially steelhead. I mean, salmon, if it's a really good salmon run, then that will happen. But for steelhead, that's very rare. So that's making a low survival rate when they're introduced into the wild. They're used to these hatchery conditions where there's always food and it's ideal. There's no predators and they're bunched up. And then as soon as they get put in the wild where there's less food, there's a lot of predators, these fish are dying quickly. So researchers are looking into if changing standard hatchery methods, if there will be a better turnover rate from bigger fish to returning to spawn and basically just a better survival rate. So basically, if they take out the uh, the normal hatchery program to where it's just a couple of concrete slabs and it's just a giant rectangle to where all these fish are just packed into and it's just a feeding time every day at the same time, maybe if they incorporated it on like a wild stream and they just put like a bunch of netting around this wild stream for a certain amount of yards whether it's 100 or 200 yards that way they could live in like a wild environment but they can't escape so they're still getting raised they're still studying still getting grown by the hatchery but it's not exactly a hatchery condition it's new they're in the wild kind of and they're still being supplemented by the hatchery and they're still being raised so they will be able to grow there actually will be a better population because of this so hopefully they figure this out because we need steelhead us, us anglers if you guys have never fished for steelhead then you guys are missing out it's one of the most fun acrobatic fights there will be in freshwater you hook one of these things especially in freshwater your drag's going to be screaming and you're going to be in a fight for your life if it's a giant steelhead this thing is just going to run it's going to run back up it's going to do flips and jumps and it's just going to give you a run for your money but on to today's current topic which is just overall ice fishing tactics now this could be for the northeastern end of the state or even a little bit out west depending on where you are this is going to cover a lot of the pan fish so perch crappy maybe some bass some smallmouth, uh walleye it's all the same general tactics all right but number one for the first ice fishing tactic which is i believe is the most important you have to find the fish just like deer and if you want to hunt a big buck you can't hunt and harvest a big buck if there's no big bucks in your area. So you can't catch fish if you're fishing where there are none. So pre-ice scouting is very important to this if you are able to do that. So if you're able to get on the lake that you plan on ice fishing earlier in like the fall or summer and you can mark like a bunch of uh, submerged cover, whether it be submerged stumps, sunken Christmas trees, rock walls, down logs, just X, Y, and Z, uh, if you could pre-scout before ice is on your lake and you could even just if you don't have a fish finder to where you can mark these things on your map and just return back to the waypoint then just try and make a mental note maybe leave like a marker on the ground uh in the, like the wood line on the edge of your lake like a balloon and then say okay it's lined up with that balloon and that dock and then you could just walk out there drill a hole and you'll be fishing right over that submerged pile where a lot of times in the winter and there's ice, then these fish are going to be schooled up over some type of cover. So if you find a submerged Christmas tree out there and there's really no other cover in that lake or very little, then there's going to be like a whole school of fish on this submerged Christmas tree. So spend like 10 minutes at a hole and move to the next hole if there's no bites to find the school. And then you could return to the holes later with different baits just to see if the bait you were using wasn't the right bait. All right, don't just change baits. Try changing your presentation. All right, yes, going through every bait in your box if you're not getting any bites, then try changing your presentation. All right, you could just be sitting over the mother load and just using the wrong bait. And most ice fishermen use long slender like vertical up and down baits or teardrop style like the cast master or spoons or the swedish pimple etc and when switching to a bait that is more wider than taller so more horizontal uh, it can be the ticket like um like the rapala ice jigs they're just like they're pretty wide depending on the size of the rapala that you are using and there's three hooks on that bait there's one up front there's one in the back and there's a little tiny treble hanging at, under the body and this thing has caught it's probably one of the most 
uh, popular ice fishing jigs in general. All right, but you can also switch to a grubs, uh, any type of grub rigged on like a jig head, a one one thirty two ounce jig head, a one sixteenth, depending on how deep you're fishing and depending on how big of a grub you are fishing. Then just switching to a grub instead of a flashy bait, that could be the ticket as well. So go through your colors, your baits, and just try and find what's working. And normally you should have an idea before you even go out there. Like I know I'm going out there with like the same couple baits I always use during the summer and the fall. I just know what's going to work on the areas that I'm fishing and just for the species I'm fishing in general. All right, another different presentation you can try is the dead stick or the line twist technique. All right, fish can get accustomed to up and down motion of jigging, and if the bite dies, try dead sticking or twisting the line between your fingers so your bait just spins or simply move your rod left and right in the hole just from the right side of the hole to the left side of the hole just to get a different motion. Instead of going up and down, you're moving it more left and right. And this line twist technique, that could be very deadly when the bite dies, not even just try to spark a bite. If the if you're killing them and then the bite dies just from up and down motions, just grab the line between your index and your thumb and just spin it back and forth. You're giving your line the line twist and that bait is just going to spin underwater. So that that's a very great technique. And dead sticking, uh, I normally don't just leave it still the entire time. Uh, my favorite technique is with a cast master. I like going with a smaller size cast master, normally silver and blue for perch and crappie and a lot of bass like this as well. It's very good for New Jersey. And I'm basically just dropping it to the bottom. I reel up one or two times and then I'm just sharp twitching like really quick. So the bait's moving like a foot and a half at a time. It's fluttering back down and then I dead stick it for like five seconds. I won't move the bait. And then I'll do it again. I'll leave it a little longer. Because a lot of times they just sit there and look at it. During ice fishing, they're sluggish. They're just going to sit there until they decide they want to bite. All right. And I just said, uh, don't just switch baits, switch presentation. Don't just switch baits, switch colors. All right. Don't just try different lures. Try live bait. Or if you're only using live bait, switch the jigs. All right. Fish can get tired of live bait as well, just as they can get used to a normal bait that they see all the time. All right, I normally will carry a few styles of lures and way more color variations when I'm ice fishing to try and find their color fetish, essentially. Whatever color they like, then that's what they're going to eat. All right, a lot of times I'll be fishing, or a lot of times if I go out with a group of people, let's say it's me, Rob, and a couple other people, so three, four, five people, we will all start out with different baits in different areas just to see what color is popping off that day. So I could start with like a silver and blue cast master. Rob could start off with a gold cast master. Someone else can start with like a rainbow trout cast master, a fire tiger one, and just on and on and on. And whichever one is popping off, then everyone can change to. And that way everyone is maximizing their efforts. But if you're alone, you can do the same thing. Start in one hole and work one color for like 10 minutes. If that's not working, switch up in the same hole, different bait, try for like 10 minutes. And then if that's not good, move to a different hole and try the same thing. And just you're just trying to find what color and what bait is working on that day. All right. And another great tip that a lot of people don't understand with this, you want to fish near the bottom or bounce the bottom. All right. It works well with bigger perch, it's stirring up some commotion on the bottom, stirring up like a little cloud of mud or dirt when it's just super calm under there. Wind doesn't really have an impact when it's iced, iced over. So they're just kind of floating around. And if you're adding any little commotion, especially like a little pop of dirt from your lure, they might just come over to inspect it. And then when you're working your jig just right, up and down, flutter action, then that perch, the big fat perch, two pounder, will just come in and slurp your bait. And then you got a giant perch on a giant butterball. All right, normally I drop to the bottom and I reel up one to three cranks and I li lightly bounce and then I sharp twitch and then I dead stick for a few seconds. So like I just said, I'll drop my lure all the way to the bottom so I know I'm in the strike zone and then I'll reel up one, two times depending how deep I am and then I will sharply twitch my jig and then let it flutter back down. I'll bounce it lightly a little bit and then I'll do a sharp twitch, let it flutter all the way back down and then I'll just dead stick it for a couple of seconds. 
So you're just trying to find that presentation that is working for them. All right, next, the my favorite time during ice fishing, I call it the flurry. All right, so basically low light conditions, so first thing in the morning and last light, last light, it normally happens way more often. There will be just a time period where like a half hour before dark, it's just absolutely a frenzy mayhem action all right it could be a slow picket perch and crappy and bass all day you might catch 10 fish throughout like six hours of fishing and then you hit that last half hour of light and i've had this many times where i'm just sitting in one hole and this is when i make sure i have like five or six holes within a 30 yard circle because i will just be fishing one hole and it will be dead action nothing and then it'll be like one and then immediately two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten perch in a row. And then a lot of times it'll be like 20, 30 perch in a row out of one hole. And then Rob's five feet across from me and he pulls out 20 perch out of one hole. And then all we have to do when that bite dies, hop to a new hole like five feet away, do the same thing. And then if that bite dies, you're just hole hopping during the flurry. All right. It is just an insane time. So you want to make sure you find them during the day when it's a slow pick. So whatever hole that you pick up a couple fish out of or at least one fish out of you return to that spot when the bite's on there could be 40 fish that you pull through that hole in the next five minutes it's that quick it's like drop hook up drop hook bring them up it's just insane action it's the last light bite flurry and that's what i live for in ice fishing all right and now away from the fishing tactics i just want to say dress warm and be comfortable when you're out ice fishing there's nothing worse than going out there and you freezing your ass off because you chose to leave your jacket in the car because you didn't want to carry it. All right, bring some hot chocolate, bring some hot coffee, bring it in like a, a thermos, just to always have it. Even if you don't drink it, you don't put it on, then at least to have it in case you do get cold. A lot of times when you're out there, uh, it'll be nice during the day, and then once it gets low light conditions, then the wind picks up, it gets freezing, your toes are cold. Make sure you have hand warmers, even if you don't use them. Make sure you have thick socks on, thick boots. You have stuff for your hands so you don't get frostbite. It's just like common sense at this point. But dress warm, dress comfortable, bring like a lawn chair, and just be comfortable, enjoy yourself on the ice. And my favorite time is when you bring like a clamshell blind out there and you got like a little space heater. That way the the people that are more prone to cold, I'll say it that way, more prone to cold, they can go in there, warm up. And then outside, you got the grill going, you got like breakfast sausages, you got everything going on the grill early in the morning, and then you can cook some hamburgers and hot dogs when it's lunchtime, dinner time, and you're just enjoying yourself on the ice. All right, ice fishing is one of the most fun times of year. A lot of people, just they just go out there with like a 24-pack of beer, and they sit out there all day with their grill, and they put out like 25 tip-ups, and they just sit there and drink and eat as the flags go up, and they're able to fish and have a good time. So have a great ice fishing year this year, whether you're in New Jersey, New York, PA, you're out west, wherever you are, have a great ice fishing year. Please be safe. Please make sure the ice is safe. Don't go on any sketchy ice. We don't need any casualties out here. All right. Us outdoorsmen, we're few and far between, depending where you are in this country, and we need to stick together. We don't need any casualties. Just stay safe. Uh, Make sure you have your ice spikes in case you do fall through the ice, you're able to get out safely. Try not to go ice fishing alone. Always bring a buddy in case something does happen. Someone is able to try and help or call call for help. Just be safe out there, guys. And uh, maybe I'll go over more specific ice fishing videos in the next couple days or next week or so. Maybe I'll go over on catching more perch through the ice, more crappy, more bass, just targeting certain species and how you can do that. But... This is FLT number 13. Thank you for tuning in to this podcast today. Uh, If you haven't checked out any of the previous 12 First Light Talks, be sure to check them out. These videos come out daily, and these are here for you. All right, I'm trying to start a community to where everyone can tune in, maybe get a little helpful information for their day. And uh, that's really it, guys. I am Mike with Obviously Outdoorsman. Get up, get after it today, and have a great day. I'm Mike. Peace, guys.